is bad. If you pack a lot of sand in there, it will be bad. Bad, higher solubility would be bad, and the health effects. But if you resin coat the stuff, you're going to get better. Black lung disease. In, in Kentucky, in the United States, there are increases in disease among miners. Miners are working longer shifts and thinner seams. At that museum out in Lithgow, I asked that they had a coal mine that was operating from 1920-something to 1950-something. And they, I asked them how thick the coal seams were, and they said about six feet. But in nearby areas, they were working underground seams that were as small as two feet. And they had people in those seams working by hand and digging up a lot of dust. So, are the, the question is, are the mines giving adequate ventilation? Are they cheating on sampling? Are the younger workers wearing proper equipment? And now mining rules are changing too. They're allowing, they're not allowing five shifts with normal product, may or may not have normal production to 100% of the past 30 shifts. And MSHA, Mining Safety Health Administration, is sending these rules to the president for approval. Which brings us to rules. Rules, regulations, they're all tough on bu doing business. Now, I don't particularly see much of a trend here, but the this is data from the World Bank on doing business and doing business in various countries, small countries. Georgia seemed to have the less, least amount of time dealing with regulations. And it was kind of on the easier side of countries to deal, do business in, but yet um, the next neighbors were not quite as easy to do business in, and they are also in the same part of the world. Where does this fit into anything else? Denmark was the sixth easiest country to do business in. China was number 89, and the United States was number four with Australia being nine. If you want to look it up yourself and look, have fun with it, you can go to this website. So what have I done in the last year for the EU people? Well, they came up with this T technical committee 154 for lightweight aggregates related to re regulated dangerous substances and the question is what happens if you dump perlite in soil? Well, as we know, it's a good thing. But they want to know what happens if it's bound in concrete or just by itself. So I wrote a letter including all relevant facts and uses to try to accept, receive acceptance without further testing. We haven't heard back yet. Denise? No, I haven't heard back. Oh. Well, this is an example of the regulations in the United States. These are, this is at a military cere uh, cemetery. And the question, you want to bring flowers in to lay on a grave. Well, you've got all this stuff to read. I'm not going to read it. That's not the point. That there are a lot of, anytime the government is involved, there's a lot of restrictions and rules. And here's 
Congress's latest attempt at reform. They're going to work on this 1976 Toxic Substances Control Act, or TOSCA. And this is a bipartisan bill. The, uh, I think Senator Lautenberg from New Jersey died a few months ago, and uh, Mr. Bitter and he had been working on this. So there is bipartisan support, but probably one of the few things out there that does. It eliminates some state regulations, including those established in California, and people in California just started sc screaming about that. So there's been some uh, possible changes in this bill. It contravenes state exemptions first introduced in the Federal Air Quality Act and later codified in the Clean Air Act. So it threatens Proposition 65, the warning labels rules, it threatens California, uh, the Global Warming Solutions Act of 2006, it does things on threatens the ban and sale and possession of shark fins, foie gras, inefficient light bulbs, and the sale of eggs laid by battery hens. These are just examples. Threatens the California Green Initiative, the uh, Green Chemistry Initiative, expands the EPA power <coughs> to screen chemicals for safety, but does not establish timelines for to establish, uh, accomplish those tasks. <coughs> Speaking of California 65, the, uh, in, for 2014, the, the chemicals on the left have been added to the Prop 65 list. And this is typical compounds that you'd find these materials in all over the place. Everything sunblock to inks to household cleansers, hardware, flavor enhancers, and back to respirable crystalline silica. Before I left, I found out that they are going to be looking at res establishing what they call a safe harbor limit concentration for respirable crystalline silica. But they won't be doing that. It's only a for quite a while. Is it's only a third priority. It's not first priority or second priority. It's only a third. And there's probably a thousand chemicals on this list. It goes through fifth priority. So we're somewhere in the middle. And the addition of these six, uh, five chemicals has created, oh, the lawyers are on this case immediately. Over 100 notices were sent to manufacturers of products containing just titanium dioxide. An additional 56 companies were threatened with lawsuits about this stuff, and so on. Right before I left, there was a, a bill that Governor Brown signed that said that if you walk into a restaurant and they don't have the accommodations for handicapped people, for example, you threaten them with an action under this Americans with Disability Act. The The retailer has a reasonable amount of time to make the corrections before you can actually sue them. And the same thing is going to happen to Prop 65. These letters may not be enforceable after it will come beginning of 2014. The manufacturer will have a reasonable amount of time to get this changed out. 
So where do we get, aside from perlite, where did all the pollution come from? Well, we're all familiar with cars, and we're all familiar with industry, but there's some natural sources as well. I know that here in Sydney there have been forest fires. There's stories about it on the news, and that we're get, coming into a brush fire season. It's kind of dry out there. I'm not sure what city this is. Could be Los Angeles, but this is. If you've not experienced a, seen a forest fire, even from far away, this is kind of what it looks like. It creates its own weather system, which could be this thundercloud, and then there's all this layer of ash. It's pretty scary out there. And of course, we've got agricultural sources of particulates. Well, here's a, an area that has accumulated a lot of particulate matter. It's not Beijing or Shanghai or Mexico City. It's in Sarajevo. And what are the consequences of, or what are the causes of this? Well, you got old vehicles. People are poor, so they burn anything. Wood, tires, coal. And the surrounding mountains inhibit air exchange. So this is in a basin, in a valley, and all that particulate matter is trapped within there. And as you, they don't have much industrial pollution controls there. It's estimated that over a million people in East Asia die prematurely due to the small two and a half micron particulate matter in the air. South Asia, India, about 400,000. Southeast Asia, 150,000 plus. Over 150,000 prematurely in Europe, and 40,000 in, in North America. I don't know whose idea it was, but in 2013, Europe declared the year of the air. Uh, it, they developed 10 concise principles, but in practice, nothing legal can ever be concise. So here's some things that I selected from the list. Citizens are entitled to clean air, just like clean water and safe food. They've got a target level of PM 2.5, but the World Health Organization target is considerably lower. American Cancer Society estimated that mortality increases by 6 to 8% for every 10 micrograms per cubic meter increase. And Another principle is that roadside pollution poses serious health threats that cannot be adequately addressed by, regulated, by regulations. Non-tailpipe emissions also pose a health threat for road users and subjects living close to busy roads. Now one of the things, Adam, I don't know what happened. Uh, I think you... I, gave you the task of finding out if anything had happened with that pavement company in, in Australia, or was it Andrew? Well, I think it was me, I don't recall. Are you the right side? The, the, the road, road, yeah. Well, Paul can, oh. Paul, no, he's, he's just stepped out for a minute. Oh. Um, yeah, we were looking at doing some trials on that. Um, using a blend of vermiculite and a paper pulp. Um, they, they did a small trial, um, which um, uh, wasn't very, not that it wasn't very effective, it wasn't an effective trial. Um, the trial was poorly designed. So I'm looking at redoing it, an, another trial, and um, I think that's still waiting for the schedule. Yeah. So it's not just the um, 
happier, it's not just about um, absorbing runoff, but also acting as a uh, fire retardant. Because only last week we had um, some very, very hot weather <coughs> and um, <coughs> brush fires were forming on the side of the road just from people driving along and flicking cigarette butts out and starting bush fire, brush fires. Um, which closed roads down and all sorts of things. So using um, vermiculite, it was vermiculite more so than perlite in that oh, okay. um, as a retardant. But I think we were working on the blend of perlite and vermiculite. Just we're, we're th I'm thinking that uh, to cushion the, the asphalt against kicking <laughs> off the sand, maybe you increase the the asphalt content a little bit with, by using the vermiculite or the perlite and it'll keep the sand in and keep the particulate level down. I don't know. But anyways, you get people living ne near busy roads and these could pose a health threat. And Nitrogen dioxide emissions are much higher than anticipated. So the, when they're actually testing for particulates, change the, the ratio of nitrogen dioxide versus all nitrogen oxides. And combustion of biomass fuel produ produces toxic pollutants. And we all know that wildfires create problems. For, for breathing. They'll also uh, take a look at the limit values for the major air pollutants and possibly get the limits closer to developed uh, limits in the US and other developed countries. This is an interesting one. I call it the Great Wall of Mulch. There's a, a freeway. You'll see the, the location in a minute. But they're putting leaf litter and other compostable materials in between two chain link fences. And they're hoping to cut back on particulate matter and other kind of pollution that drifting through there. And while we were headed out to the Blue Mountains, I had Jose take a photograph of something they're doing here by roadsides where they've got a wire mesh around rocks. And it's, which is sort of similar to the concept, I believe, in the state of Washington with the where they've got the dolomite and the gravel and the perlite, except this is actually, what they're doing here is designed so that rocks don't fall down and that other materials don't fall down. On. Uh, there's, this morning, there's a report of a tanker truck that got, that flipped over and exploded near here somewhere and fuel escaped and they were worried about how much fuel actually made it into the streams and into the water uh, supply, the, the groundwater. So they're going to evaluate that, but if they had something to catch all that stuff on the side of the road, perhaps all they would have had to do is dig up the, the perlite, the vermiculite, the, the absorbent of whatever kind, and replace it and go on with life. But you'll see in a, here in a minute, here's the location. And that great wall of mulch is going to go here. Here's a park. There's a school over here, down here somewhere. Here are community gardens. There's a freeway here. There are rail lines here. And there's homes over here. So all these people over here live downwind of rail lines, freeways, 
and they may be eating produce grown in these gardens which could be contaminated with heavy metals and organic pollutants off of tires, off of diesel fumes. We'll see what happens. So the question is, is this three foot meter thick layer of mulch tree trimmings going to help anything? It's 12 feet tall. They'll see about the compaction resistance over time. Can it reduce sound or noise from adjacent roads and tracks? Will it reduce pollution, the smells? Can it cut down on respiratory illnesses of the people who live in the area? And can it cut back on the heavy metal content in the soils? So will perlite increase the mulch? If, let's assume that it does work, sort of, but they need to get more throughput. Would the perlite increase the mulch porosity, increase the filtration ability, help them main, maintain dimensional stability, or have a negative effect? If you have an opportunity, please try this at home. Or something like that. This is an example of site remediation. There's heavy equipment involved. They're digging up stuff. Thank you, PVP, for providing these photos. Lenny, PVP. Okay. It took, I believe, it took this brown area, dumped some perlite in it, and a year, next year it looked like this. out at the um, mining museum, they had an area, a mound of rock dust and coal, and it was filled with grasses, but I don't know what else they could grow there. It'd be interesting if you guys could, the local folks here could go out there and see if they'd be willing to run some trials with perlite and without perlite see what kind of trees grow in, in that area or, or not. Another thing that's in, on people's minds now is climate change. What is it? What do you do about it? Does it? And we have this committee of blind people here examining this elephant and seeing different portions of it. And, how do we put that all together? And the way I see it at the moment, this is hard data, atmospheric CO2. There's some questions over global temperatures. There's some questions over polar ozone holes and where they're going. And some questions over sea ice levels. El Nino versus La Nina, we don't know if that does anything one way or the other. And volcanoes definitely do something to climate change. Sunspots definitely do something to climate change. And um, if anybody wants to know the widget is, you'll see it later. But it's basically a computer application that tracks things. So at Mauna Loa in Hawaii, they've been measuring CO2 levels in the atmosphere, and as you can see, it's been going up. It's not surprising, but it's going up. Does that mean anything? This, this gentleman here, Dr. Roy Spencer, is a anthropomorphic global warming denier. So if he says something's actually happening, I'd probably listen. And he seems to think that uh, the satellite data, he works at the University of Alabama at Huntsville, so that's what UAH stands for. Um, he seems to think that this temperature, uh, satellite-based temperature readings are meaningful. And 
I'm not sure if you can draw a trend from 1979 to 2013, but it looks like it could be. So uh, there's the, the data is based on microwave observations, and balloon data and surface data is somewhat different. So there's controversy over the validity of the satellite data. But let's take a look at the information over uh, gathered by different a variety of different means over a longer period of time. And you see that starting in 1900, there was definite cooling, lasted through 1940, and then kind of bounced around to 1980-ish, and we've gotten hotter since then. There's a graphic on the television last night that Australia has seen its hottest December on record. Is that part of it? I don't know. So the details of this curve versus the satellite data may be in dispute, but the general shape of it is still there. The ozone holes. The ozone holes may, in the Arctic, there was thinning, may have been an anomaly. Unusually calm spring winds, extreme cold, and chlor high chlorine concentrations in the atmosphere. In the Antarctic, what this shows, the hole continues to improve, but does it shift clouds southward, increasing energy flux to the surface? Maybe. So in other words, the uh, lower latitudes in the southern hemisphere may be getting more sunlight because cloud cloudiness tends to go to the higher latitudes. In the Arctic, sea ice has been below normal the past four years. In February, it's been way below normal in September. And it looked like, who knows what it was, this is the latest data for July 2013 that I found. Don't know where it's going to wind up as a minimum here. And interestingly enough, I've always heard about El Nino and La Nina. They're actually, this actually suggests that there's a difference in sea level at any particular place in the Pacific Ocean based upon whether it, where you are, I, based on whether you're in a La Nina or an El Nino situation. For example, where they, on the side where you've got warm water, that water has expanded and will occupy a greater volume than the cold water on the other side. So there actually will be a higher level at the warm side. And El Nino gives Southern California at least a lot of rain. La Nina does not. There's also, as I mentioned, volcanic activity that affects global temperatures. As of August 19th, when I prepared this, there are over 30 volcanoes actively erupting around the world and 30 more that were under eruption alert or having minor events, in other words, burp. Burp. I didn't have any data com to compare to. And the more SO2 that gets emitted into the atmosphere, I believe, 
the temperature goes down. So there's to the total emissions were unknown at that time. And if, if you want a tour of the island of Milos, you can go to that website and sign up for one. Excuse me, Ken. Yeah. Did you say that the if uh, SO2 emissions increase? The yeah, the, the amount of...